ladies and gentlemen, it's a great pleasure to be here tonight, having such a great audience, and thank you very much, Professor Bidika, for this very nice introduction. It's almost embarrassing to hear all this, but let's not dwell on that, but let's just go on and uh, talk a little bit about the quantum revolution from my point of view. We have heard a lot of this during the week, and many things, many point of views, and now I add my five cents to it. But the subject of tonight is a little different. Tonight, we really want to delve into a specific subject. We want to think about applying quantum physics to doing computations. So it's the quantum way of possibly doing computations that's the subject of tonight's talk. And what I'd like to convey to you that this kind of quantum technology, which is hidden in this little iron trap, as you'll see it later on, is maybe one of the basic uh, quantum computers, basic com uh, technologies for the 21st century. But let me just uh, uh, tell you briefly what I'd like to do. I would like to take you along on a journey that starts from quantum physics in general, then to the technologies of the modern information age. And now I would like you to relax. No formulas, no nothing. You just sit down, buckle up, and listen. So what we are going to do tonight, we first of all want to review what the advances of computer technologies are these days, where we are, where we stand, and where we want to go. After that, we have to remind you a little bit, I know you, by now you're almost experts after four talks of this week, but I want you to remind of what the notions are, what are quanta, what is quantum physics. And again, this is my five cents I would like to add to this. Then. Uh, you get another crash course to quantum mechanics, a little different way. Then, finally, we come to the point and want to answer the question, why the heck do we actually want a quantum computer? Something exotic? Is that necessary? And why do we do it? And finally, we have to go to the bits and pieces, that's in this case the quantum bits, the quantum registers that we will need for a computational task, and the quantum gate operations that we need in order to fulfill them. And then we will use all the strange things that you've heard about this week. First of all, superpositions, and then what we heard last about, the entanglement that will be put to work in such a quantum computer. And then finally, I would like to show you what kind of Lego blocks we will need in order to build such a quantum computer. And one of those really important Lego blocks is going to have atoms, individual atoms, trapped in cages. So we lock them up and tame them and have them available at our will, at our fingertips, just to make them do what we want. Then I'll show you how this really works, and you'll see later on, this is sort of an atomic scale Star Wars that we are trying to do, with lasers and individual atoms, not with stars in this case. And at the end, I'll come then to the conclusion of the quantum revolution as I see it, and I hope I can convince you that this is providing us with a new technology for the information age of the 21st century. So let's get started. We start, of course, in the past, as we are all standing on the shoulders of giants. If you look back to the history of computation, you'll find that very many generations have worked on that, and here's just an example from the 19th century. This picture shows you Charles Babbage's difference engine that was conceived in the 19th century, but that piece of work that sits now in the museum in London, that's actually built in the, in the 20th century, because at the time when Charles Babbage conceived that idea how to do that computational machine, the materials and the technologies were just not right to make this. Only with the technology of the 20th century, this could be realized almost 100 years later after it was conceived and then put to work, and it works like a beauty. Later on, in the 20th century, here's one of the founding fathers in Germany of the computers. This was built in his living room in Berlin, Konrad Zuse Z1, that was built in Berlin 1937, and it really marks the world's first really programmable, in this case, mechanical computer. 
So this is the history of computers as we know it. And then in the 40s, we see a big computer like that. On that big computer, which fills an entire room, this magazine, Popular Mechanics, writes in March 1949, only about 60 years ago, where a calculator on the ENIAC, that stands for Electronic Numerical Integrator and Computer, is equipped with 18,000 vacuum tubes and weighs 30 tons, computers in the future may have only 1,000 tubes and weigh only one and a half tons. <laughs> okay. You can see how much technology has advanced over the last 60 years. And uh, this actually is now that what I would like to talk to you about from the conception of that mechanical computer of the 2ZZ1 to what we really conceive now as computation done on single atoms, it's only a mere 70 years. And we have seen very many computers down to the Pentium that we now use in most of these uh, computers these days. And if you just look at the computer development over these last years, then we have seen, so from starting from the ENIAC eventually to the single atom, a law that was formulated empirically by none other than the founding father of Intel Corporation who invented the Pentium and uh, all these uh, chips. And what he says, what it's, this law essentially says is that about every 18 months the computer power doubles. That's you all know because every two years or so you have to go to a computer store to buy a new piece of equipment because your computers, your software won't run anymore. So this is actually done by purpose, on purpose, because he f figured out that for the semiconductor industry, if you just look at the number of transistors per die that's used to integrate the circuits, you find a law that's given mostly by that straight line. This is what we call a logarithmic view. This is an orders of magnitude, but this is the number of years. And you see that apparently every 18 months, this is roughly right, the computer power doubles. This holds for memories, this holds for processors, MOS arrays and all of the semiconductor industry is actually following that so-called roadmap. That roadmap projects actually where the industry is supposed to be in two, four, eight years from now. In this case, we always assume that we get faster machines by making things smaller, going from the room to down to that chip and eventually to the single atom. And you have all seen these famous supercomputers of the past. The ENIAC that I've talked about in 1947, the famous gray in the 70s and the early 80s, and now in the 2000s, the IBM Deep Blue machines and so forth. There are many more over the world. But essentially, these classical computers are nothing else but fast switching machines. So there are no mechanical switches. There are electric, uh, electric switches like transistors and circuits, but essentially, they are switching machines. That can be cast in a slightly different way. Suppose now, for instance, we ask ourselves the questions, how many atoms do we actually need in order to realize an individual bit of information? And again, I take now data from Rob Keys of IBM and extrapolate them, and these data lie, start around 1960 right here, on this line, in a very simple, similar empirical law, like Moore's law. And you see that this goes down, and even the Pentium 4, I've calculated it, lies on the straight line right here. And if you extrapolate that, around here we get a, cross section, a crossover. So we see right here that at this point, this line is, crosses the line with a single atom per bit. At the latest, around the, the year 2017, maybe 2020, I don't care, but plus or minus three years, we will encounter difficulties, at least technical difficulties, because we have to encode if that roadmap is supposed to hold the bit of information in individual atoms. At the latest time, that marks the point where the laws of quantum physics have to take over. We know that the laws of quantum physics are used well before that, and we already are uh, encountering difficulties to do it. So this is not clear whether we can still pursue that straight line and whether the roadmap of semiconductor physics actually can continue as indicated. So what to do with it? What's the computer of the future? You know, there are some famous movies like uh, uh, Stanley Kubrick's 2001. He had the famous computer HAL. I trust you that everybody knows what HAL means. If not, the question can be asked during the session. And this is the famous HAL in space. 
Odyssey 2001? Or, do we go to the very small? Can we go to a quantum computer that operates with a single atom as sketched in this little cartoon? That's a great question. And uh, in order to answer these questions, we, of course, contact authorities. Here is one authority that was mentioned before. Erwin Schrödinger in Austria uh, came up with an answer to that when he was uh, in Ireland in those days. And he said in 1952, in the first place, it is fair to state that we are not experimenting with single particles any more than we can raise ichthyosauria in the zoo. And a little bit below, this is the obvious way of retrospecting the fact that we never experiment with just one electron or atom or small molecule. In thought experiments, we sometimes assume that we do. This invariably entails ridiculous consequences. I hope what I'm going to talk about today is not entirely ridiculous, and I hope I can convince you that technology has advanced to the point that we not only can control, but also manipulate individual atoms to that degree. Let's come back to physics and technology. Physics, as we all know, has advanced technology for centuries, and quantum mechanics, as we by now know, after these four talks and the beautiful physics we heard about, is certainly one of the crowning intellectual discoveries of the 20th century. And the question that we are really asking here for this talk tonight and for what I'm doing is quantum physics and information science the basis for the technology, at least for the information technology in the 21st century. And the question is even more general because quantum physics could be very well the basis for the technology everywhere in the 21st century. So let's just uh, remind you what I think about quantum physics. What are those quanta? What is quantum? Now we have heard about these things. Quanta are those indivisible elementary packets of matter, for instance, atoms, electrons. And you know, there's a whole zoo. When you go a little bit to CERN, you'll find even more of those. And of energy, we've heard of the light quanta, in particular, let's say, night in Alain and Space Talk, we have talked about photons. But there's but one rule. There's no equation. All equations derive from that. There's one rule that you have to keep in mind when you go home tonight. Quantum systems are different from a classical system because in the quantum world, an observed system is different from an unobserved system. And I'll come back to that repeatedly to show you what that really means and what consequences that has. So for example, when we do some in investigations in quantum physics, in particular in quantum optics, the world where I come from, we study how physics works with these single quanta. For example, we study the behavior and the interaction of single photons, how they interact, for example, with single atoms on we, uh, uh, we study now what is the reaction product. So for example, we take the image of a single photon impinging on an atom, and once this atom absorbs the photon, because the photon had, has, has had the right color, the atom gets excited. That's what we learn in school. And that's a very basic process, for example. We study, of course, with this elementary quantum physics, try to understand these things, try to understand quantum mechanics, even if it's fairly difficult, as we saw last night and we try to make fundamental measurements. But aside from that basic research, we are also on the lookout for applications. And these applications, as we have seen repeatedly throughout the week, are in many, many areas of uh, physics. Because this is so important, let me just give you my short introduction to quantum physics. How do we do this? We have heard repeatedly throughout the week that quantum mechanics is a statistical theory. What does that mean? So for example, I prepare a state for quantum right here, and I want to measure that. So we want to observe that state. So for example, we prepare a single photon right here. If you just pay attention closely, you'll see that photon just uh, emanating from that orifice. Oh yes, there, there it was. And there is a detector. That detector says one. It's a dichotomic measurement. We either observe it or we don't observe it. Because if I repeat the measurement, the detector, for whatever reason, would say no, there was nothing. And now, in order to get now something, a result that we talk about in quantum physics, we have to repeat that many, many, many times. So we just get repeated information in terms of, yes, there was an answer, no, there was no answer, and so forth. And in the end, we ask ourselves, how often have we seen the one, and how often have we seen the zero, like in lottery out of 49. 
And in the end, we call that the probability of observing the one and that the probability of observing the zero. And the quantum physics that we have learned about this week only talks about these probabilities and about nothing else. Single event has hardly any meaning. Let's do this a bit more in a trickier version. We just now do that experiment by having a screen right here. This is our detector, could be a CCD camera. And we have an orifice here and another orifice there. But now we prepare the particles and let them go through these orifices. What happens? Okay, now we get a click right here on the screen. Okay, so let's repeat this over and over again. As I said before, there's many, many clicks. It happens, we get all the events right here on the detector. That's really like an experiment. That's something that we do in the laboratory all the time. Now this carries on and on. It's getting boring usually in the laboratory. We just uh, tend to sit back and wait the whole night until this is over. I don't want to have you sitting here until this is finished. Let's just make a short story, a long story short. In the end, you get an envelope like that because you just had these two orifices. Now your question is, come on, I had light particles. What is going on here? Can I really see this? Or is this just a Gedanken experiment by Platt who just made this up? No, it is not. Here is an experiment from uh, a group in Cajon, uh, where Alain Aspé and Philippe Granger contributed to uh, in 2005. So you see a similar experiment right here. You really see on a real CCD camera that such a pattern builds up. And each individual spot corresponds to a single photon observed. This is really like the spot that we've seen before. And there are places where are hardly any photons recorded, and there are places where you see many photons. This is shown in here in this figure, which now carries on because the experiment is now a bit faster. Now, the question is, and you've seen that this, uh, this week, how do we describe this? Apparently, we have particles going there, but in order to predict what's going to happen, we have to solve a wave equation. And if we solve the wave equation, we get the answer that the intensity that we observe on the screen is just given by this pattern. Perfect. Now the answer is, the question is, or the answer you have to surmise, okay, so I don't have particles, I have waves. And we've had this discussion many times over the week. So we see the wave behavior, we see interference that's going on, so we have the minima and maxima, and we understand this in terms of waves. But let's just uh, be a bit more tricky. We can actually try to figure out where the particle went through. What did the particle actually do when it moved from here to there? So, for example, we can ask which of the orifices did it go through, because we know this is a quantum, it's indivisible. So we have a single quantum going there. Okay, let's try to do this. We'll make an experiment like that, but by closing that slit right here, or that orifice, and then we ask what is the answer that we get. You've seen quantum mechanics predicts the wave equation, we do the same thing, and we get the result. Okay, so there's a hump like this that we observe right there. If you do the same thing on the other side, you would get the hump like that. That would be the distribution of particles which went through that lower slit. Now, if we add these distributions, we see it would be a maximum right there, but it looks completely different from what we observed before. Why is that? Here, the interference is destroyed. And what happened here is the attempt to trace the path of the particle by just closing one of the orifices, by knowing which way it went, actually changed already the experimental setup and thus what is observed or what actually happened. Can we look a tiny little bit? I mean, we don't have to close it completely. We can make it smaller. And we just look a little bit here. We want to derive a slight information. If you do that, you get a slightly skewed information right here. It works most of the time, but not quite so nicely as we thought it would work. And even if we do this with a microscope, it would influence the measurement and the system. So in the end, whatever we do, and the more accurately we look, the more we change the system at hand. This is what I mean. The measurement acts back on the system. And this is quantum physics as we know it. As we observe it in the laboratory, there's no denying. You don't see this in daily life, but we see as this as physicists with our microscope, with our big machines, whether that's a microscope like CERN, or whether it's a microscope that we use in the quantum optics lab, doesn't really matter. So, for example, when we ask the question here, 
in which state is actually the electron of an atom here. That quantum state is the electron is unknown to the point that we have to assume there is a superposition of things going on here. And we now measure that uh, this we observe, for instance, light scattered from an individual atom, what we actually can do, as I'll show you a little later. Then you find the electron in the ground state, or as we say, in the excited state. That is, we always find it in zero or one. We get a dichotomic answer. We don't get anything else, and we have to measure repeatedly in a probabilistic way, in a statistical way, to derive the answer of what really was true. But, that's a big but now, if we really measure where this information really is, how the heck can we actually make quantum information processing with that? Because a quantum state really means we cannot copy it. Whenever we try to copy that, we destroy it. This is known as the no cloning theorem in quantum physics. How can one ever do something with this? I'll come back to this point. Before that, let's just uh, review the century of quantum physics. Things have started around 1900 with the quantum introduced by Max Planck. Bohr introduced the first model of the atom, and then the Schrödinger and Heisenberg, they, Schrödinger came up with the wave model, Heisenberg with the matrix equations to solve these sums. There's a solution was in the 20s, and that's when we had the golden years of the quantum mechanics because they were able to describe a whole lot of things at once. Until 1935, we had the einstein podolsky rosen paper and Schrodinger's cat and the entanglement phenomenon we heard so much about yesterday night, which put for the first time a dent in the picture. Now it's so beautiful, but do we actually understand it? What's going on here? It looks like a paradox. Until John Bell came and he invented a test of whether quantum mechanics, the way we know it, is really right or wrong. And that led eventually then to applications that we heard about and to one more application I can't, will come to in a, in a minute that we call now quantum computing. So in a mere 70 years, we came from a paradox to a practical application. Let's come back to information processing. And let me remind you of one thing that's maybe not so obvious to most of you. Information processing is actually always a physical process. Computation is a physical process. Look at this, for example. You usually start out before we do a computation with some input. We will end with some output. And in between, we have to carry out that computation. How do we do this? No matter how you do that on a piece of paper, in your mind, or with a computer, it has to be physically realized. So we start out with a physical object. And look at this. This is one of my favorite computers, the Abacus. So you just set a set of balls right here. And you read the final position of the balls as a result. But in between, your computational process has to be physically implemented by moving the balls back and forth all the time. So current computers process this information, process, process information according to the laws of classical physics. And even if you work with a supercomputer of today, in principle, it's happening exactly like that. It's a mechanical, or say an electrical switch that does everything and that moves these things. These are classical computers. Now, that was long ago recognized by Wolf Landauer from IBM, who said in his very brief, very elegant man, but very brief and concise, information is physical. That's exactly what he meant by that. This was a little later than recognized by David Deutsch, who said at the fundamental level, nature obeys the laws of quantum theory, as we have seen this week. Now, at the fundamental level, information science must then be a quantum information science. Which, of course, leads immediately to the question, can we perhaps use computer of the future and can they better exploit the quantum properties of information to, uh, to, to perform tasks that are beyond what can conceivably be achieved with conventional silicon-based information processes? We'll see. What kind of applications could that be? Why the heck do we want something that's so weird as a quantum computer? Now, the whole hype started about 1995 when this gentleman, Peter Shaw from AT&T, came up with an algorithm where he showed that if you had a quantum computer, then you could, for example, factor a large numbers much faster than you could ever do with a classical machine. 
Why is this important? Sounds like a mathematical problem as this generic answer, applications in physics and mathematics, why bother? Now, this is not quite right. You bother because most of all crypto cryptography that's nowadays used, whether you just uh, send your email, uh, make uh, all your order via internet and things like that, is based on the fact that we cannot really factor large numbers easily. So for example, this number, this is 317 digits. If you want to factor that, then you find out that this is just this number times that number. I'm sure you would have guessed. <laughs> In fact, this is not so easy. This is a real hard problem because this took many months on thousands of computers to first do this. And that sheer impossibility gives you the ability to use a public key in order to encrypt your data because even if you have a public key there, your adversary could not easily crack your code because then he would have to perform the task of factoring that large number first. So this is what we use these days. Now you can see actually why this is so important. If you had a quantum computer, then all of nowadays cryptography would be rendered useless aside from using quantum cryptography as Nicolas Gisin uses here and can be done these day, days. But quantum physics would allow you to do away with all these uh, classical cryptography schemes. So this set up a hype because all of a sudden very many agencies who had to hide something poured money into it because they wanted to know, can I actually build one or is there something? Whatever. So this is uh, one of the applications. The other application that is important came up then with Love Grover of uh, Lucent. And he discovered that you actually could make a fast database search if you had a quantum computer. Why is that important? A database, for instance, let's look at the telephone book. The telephone book of a city with a million inhabitants, Geneva doesn't have quite that many, but let's take a million because it's easy. Has a million entries, roughly, because everybody has a phone. Now, if you have the name and look at the phone number, that's easy because it's a sorted list. That's what the phone book is made for. But now assume you had a f phone number and you wanted to have the name and the address. In the worst case, you would have to search from A to Z to find the address. It's not a sorted list in this respect. And the average it takes half the number of entries. That would be half a million. What Love Grover showed, if you had a quantum computer that operates with the laws of quantum physics, then you could reduce the number of the searches to the square root of the entries. The square root of a million is a thousand. So instead of searching 500,000 entries, you only would have to look up a thousand entries. So you can actually see that this is a fairly good uh, algorithm that can be used also to optimize data. In physics, this has long been suggested to use quantum machines to do some physical simulations and computations that cannot be done otherwise. I don't want to bother you. The first person who came up with that was Richard Feynman. He suggested that already in the 80s. And what I personally think, and which is not very often uh, considered as very important, which I personally think for me is important, we now actually look at quantum physics with what I call the information-guided eye. What do I mean with that? I don't want to go into these details tonight because it's beyond the scope of this talk, but we've learned in the meantime that things that are ubiquitous in uh, information science, like error correction, can now be done also in quantum information processing, which I assumed not to be possible but 15 years ago. when We all started with that. And there's a number of other applications I don't want to, don't, can't go into for time reasons. In any case, so it seems to be very interesting to do that. The question is only, oh, okay, so this is not what I wanted to have. <laughs> okay, this is, okay. This is not a quantum computer, sorry for that. Okay, let's go on. Now we have a problem. Good. So what I wanted to do instead is with you really, really show you how to do quantum computing. And for this, we have to again go to the two ingredients that we've learned so often about this week. First of all, 
uh, the notion of superpositions, and secondly, the notion of entanglement. And we want to employ this in a quantum machine. So let's just talk about bits and pieces that we need for that. A bit, as, as we know, a classical bit, zero or one, that would be a switch in the on position or a switch in the off position. And the same could be done, of course, in a quantum world. You could have an atom in the ground state and excited state. But we know in the quantum world we also can have superpositions. And the superposition of, say, two states, which are either or or both simultaneously, that's called a quantum bit. And since we don't know where this is, we just write it as a superposition of off and on with certain numbers that we put in front of that. Then we have the two variables that we can be cast on a sphere. So we just we have to, in, we have to in, envisage the quantum information as an arrow that points at the surface of a sphere, and we don't know exactly where it points to, but where it points is given by these two parameters. But we remember, if we had this, and you want now to make a measurement, this measurement acts back, so whenever you do it, you find it off or you find it on. And again, remember, when you do this repeatedly, then only you find the, the, the certain statistics how you do that. That you actually can do this in a laboratory is shown here. We have such a quantum switch, and you make those measurements. So each measurement was here done 200 times. And you see, with a very nice statistics, we find all of these positions on that sphere. The arrow points down, that's right here, points up, that's right here, and all points in between. And the probability for having the on and off is just given by the squares of these numbers. So they add up to 1, because with the probability 1, we have the position anywhere. This can be done in the lab, and this is available to us. Now, how do I have to envisage such a superposition? And here, you see the classical bit is 0 or 1. Here in this picture, you see sort of a, it's half right, gives you an impression what the quantum bit could be. You either see the young lady with the nice eyelashes here, or you see the elderly lady with these ugly teeth. But you don't see both at the same time. So whenever you measure, you see it either or. And, but this information is in the picture available. Somebody, some physicists came up with another idea. You know all that picture here from the Mona Lisa. And uh, this was published some years ago. So if you just look at the Mona Lisa and you plank away a few of these pixels, so for example, if you look at the Mona Lisa that way, she looks fairly sad. If you do it that way, she looks fairly happy. And now what he figured out, if you just employ the laws of superposition, that's how you get the strange smile of Mona Lisa. I'm not sure whether this is really the background behind it, but you can, you can play these games. Now you go on. We just take that superposition of one qubit, and we take it, we generalize it. Because with a computer, we need more than one qubit. We need a whole register. So for example, we take our classical bit, and this is our quantum bit. Our classical register would be 101, for example, in this case. In the Pentium that we are using in those computers, it would be 32 bits. But then, in the quantum register, we would have to take into account that possibly all of these numbers are simultaneously present. Remember what we heard here last night? This is entanglement. This is what Schrödinger uh, coined Verschränkung in German, and this is what we call entangled states. That is, we have to say we have, in quotation marks, all of these numbers in the register at the same time. And now you can actually see why quantum computers are possibly so fast. Because you start with the superposition of all of these states, and you end after a process of the quantum process with the superposition of these states. At that point, you haven't gained any information. The information you gain only, the real information, when you make a measurement. And of course, you find either one zero or one or zero or one, whatever. That's classical information. As long as we have a superposition, it's quantum information. Now, that speeds things up, really. Look at that. These superpositions that we have define many computational paths. Because now we have a qubit, n, and we have several qubits here. One qubit has two computational paths. Two, it's four, and four, it's 16. It goes as two to the power n. And the 64 qubits, we have already very many paths that could simultaneously interfere and create an interference pattern, as we have seen before. And I just have to ask, where are the zeros and the ones? Where's the high, uh, there's the troughs, and where's the, where's the peaks? 
with already 300 qubits, if you could ever do this, the number of those computational paths would exceed the number of atoms in the universe. This is unheard of. This is new. This is really powerful, if you could ever master this. And that's why this is so interesting. Now we have to go a little further. We have to understand how we do the process, the quantum information processing. Remember, quantum information was sketched here as an arrow pointing to a certain point on the sphere. If you want to manipulate it, we have to find a means of changing that arrow to any other place without measuring if we don't measure it. So we just change the relative position by a certain angle. This is what we call a rotation of a single qubit for obvious reasons, because we rotate that arrow on the sphere. This is called a one bit or one qubit rotation. But there's one operation that is in present in all computers, which is much more complicated. You know, in computers, you sometimes have to make a decision. If one condition is present, then I have to make that operation. If then decisions. If then decisions clearly rely on two qubits. One presents the controlling bit, the condition, and the other one is the target bit that is to be controlled. This is, in classical computers, known as the Boolean exclusive OR operation. Sorry for this uh, mathematical language here, but this is really known to very many of you. The equivalent truth table is written here, but in a funny way, because we've used these bra and ket uh, way of writing things, which insinuates we have quantum numbers here. So this really means this is to be treated as a quantum information system. And as you know by now, quantum information deals with superpositions. This truth table must hold not only for, say, one part pointing down, and as soon as this controlling bit is set or up in the up point direction, then the target bit is being flipped. That would be just a logical switch, but it has to hold for any superposition. If 60% probability that is set, then only with that kind of a probability I'll do this. And not only with the probability, we have to do this with these amplitudes that we've seen before. That's a real hard task. I don't want to go into more details of that, but we have to realize this. But the beauty of that was found immediately in the mid-90s. These two operations already, already together, they together give you a complete set of operations that you need. It's a universal set. Universal in that way that virtually any operation, any algorithm can be cast in a sequence of the one qubit operations and the two qubit operations. And that's in a very important message which, because it means once you're able to master uh, rotating that arrow to arbitrary positions with one qubit operations, and once you're able to master that truth table in a superposition fashion, then you could build a quantum computer. So we have now a recipe how to build it, a blueprint. Everybody, if you can, almost build it now. You start out with a superposition right here. You end up with a superposition. And we have seen the quantum process can be subdivided in a sequence of single qubit and two qubit operations in an order that is given to you by a programmer that breaks down the algorithm that you want to perform in a sequence of those things. This is the machine language, the assembly language. These are the gory details you don't want to know about. But this can be done. So the computation then is nothing else but an input operation in terms of a superposition. The output is also a superposition and the computation is taken as a series of those quantum gate operations that are broken down in single qubit and two qubit operations. Recipe is there. Question is how to build one. We take qubits, another qubit, put them together to register. We need a platform for input and output operations, and we need the operations to make that. And this is now investigated worldwide with a whole number of technologies that I don't want to go into details. So, for example, atoms in traps serve as individual qubits. I'll come back to that. Atoms and resonators serve as uh, qubits and also as transmission lines for photons that com uh, communicate these things. Nuclear magnetic resonance is very often used for these tomography machines. It can serve as quantum simulators, superconducting qubits, solid state concepts, uh, con concepts so-called quantum dots, optical qubits, even with photons you can do computations. 
electrons on helium surfaces and very exotic now things are done. At this time, since 1995, when all this started, there is about 20 different technologies that are currently investigated worldwide to do this. We don't want to go through all these details. You have to remember, what we need are quantum systems that can be controlled at will. You really need to point to an individual qubit, and you need to be able to manipulate those qubits. And not all of the technologies can do that. And I just want to point out one, uh, atoms and traps. That's, uh, uh, I think, at this time, the most promising technology, which fulfills all these requirements. Now we'll go to talk about this bit in the remainder of the talk. So let's ask our peers again. A single atom as a qubit. This is Richard Feynman in an article in 1986 saying, we are to be even more ridiculous later and consider bits on, written on one atom instead of the present 10 to the 11 atoms. Such nonsense is very entertaining professors like me. I hope you'll find it interesting and entertaining also. So I hope you are still with me and find it still entertaining. I remind you, we have our atom which is in state zero and state one. This is what we would measure, and this is what we usually now want to encode as quantum information. This is the arrow that points us a certain error, uh, point at the sphere, which is just representing that we have a certain superposition in our system. Now, how can we actually have single atoms available? And this is due to these two gentlemen here. This is Hans Demelt and Wolfgang Paul. Uh, they received in 1989 the Nobel Prizes in Physics for trapping individual particles. Uh, he did the trapping of individual particles. Wolfgang Paul invented the trap who, with which it was possible to do this. And laser cooling was invented by others. We have seen that in talk by Wolfgang Ketteler, and they received the Nobel Prize in 1997. And uh, today, we are able to localize a single atom, as you see here in the image uh, of one of our experiments in Innsbruck, in such a trap, and I'll show you how that works in a minute, where you can just look at a single atom in free space. For me, this is still one of the most fascinating things that there is. We have an experiment where you can actually watch the fluorescence of a single atom isolated in space with the naked eye. And if you ever visit us in Innsbruck, and you're welcome, I'll show you that. It really is fantastic. I cannot even convey my enthusiasm that you can see a single atom, you know, that's just one atom radiating light, individual photons shooting at me. It's fantastic. And this is what's enabled by these prices, by these people. And today, the most precise atomic clock, for example, is based on such a single ion. This is the group of David Vineland and NIST, and uh, it was realized in 2006, and it's getting better and better. So anyway, how do we trap such an atom? Now, in this case, what we do is we just steal an electron of the atom, so we make it charged. So the atom, that is the little ball here, has a positive charge. And then, this is after the model after Wolfgang Paul, we subject to a potential, which is uh, focusing in one direction, so it just like a ball would roll back and forth here, but it would roll down there. Of course, we do this with voltages, so we apply voltage which is negative, which is positive here, so it repels a positively charged ion, and negative there. But then you would say it's never stable. But then we rotate it. Let me just show you what happens if you rotate that. Sorry. This is uh, rotating things. We do this experiment with a little table tennis ball. You see, this is the surface. Gravity keeps it there. And then it would actually roll down on the sides if you stop this. But since you rotate it at the right moment, then it always finds on the average a hill that it can't go away. This is how you keep it. And we do the very same thing with an atom, but with a charged atom in electrical fields. We just change the frequency of the fields back and forth. We just change the polarity and keep it there. So let's just go on. And this is the real drop that we now employ. You see the four electrodes right here. And we make it linear so that we have many more atoms along this axis. So these, we apply a positive voltages to these plates and negative to these and vice versa and then keep them on average there. You apply laser beams and the laser beams, they can actually excite these atoms to fluorescence and the fluorescence is in the blue that's taken here by the CCD camera and we can even address individual laser beams to these individual atoms sitting there. So in fact, we get a picture like that on the CCD camera where you see atoms like a string of pearls sitting right next to each other. 
Because they are charged, they repel each other, and they are now sitting there because they are laser-cooled. Wolfgang Kettler will talk to, to you about laser cooling on Tuesday. And laser cooling makes them almost completely motionless. Not quite, but almost motionless. And we just have a string of atoms sitting right next to them. Now, how to use that for a quantum computer was invented by these two guys, uh, Ignatius Sirac and Peter Soller. And they showed in their by now famous paper in 1995 a recipe how to do this. We just have these atoms sitting side by side make use of their internal levels, details don't matter, and you shine laser beams on them individually because the laser beams are now doing the manipulations. They just turn the arrows according to what, I've, what you've shown before. They are able, with a laser beam for a certain time, then the arrow just moves to a certain position. We don't know where the arrow was, but we can just change the arrow by a certain amount. This is known in physics, and they suggested to use this. In the meantime, there are many more of these things, but in any way, I'm proud to say the quantum computer is an invention of the Tyrol. Now, how does it look like? It looks like so. We have this, this is a real trap, how it looks like. You have these, in this case, eight ions sitting side by side here, and each qubit are now the two electronic states of a single ion. And we individually manipulate this information with laser pulses, and the ions feel each other, so that's the way we convey the information, the quantum information, by either having them vibrate or not vibrate. And we control the vibration of the ions to a quantum level. You can either say there's no vibration or there's just one quantum of vibration in the system in a controlled manner. And this is what we call now the phonon data bus according to the invention by Ignacio and Peter. And just to show you how this would look like in a real string, this is an experiment. This is no simulation. These are data that we took in our trap uh, more than 10 years ago. But this is a classical vibration because the quantum motion would hardly be seen. And then, of course, we would destroy the quantum motion by just looking at it. So the phonon data bus is the same vibration, but the vibration of the ion string with just one or no quantum of motion. That's the kind of control we need in order to get this going. Now, nowadays, we worked in the first 10 years of that with these kind of strings, single lines you've seen that picture before, two, three, nine, and 10 qubits. Nowadays, over the last three years, we have extended our, exper uh, our experiments so we can work with 32, 40, up to 64 qubits these days. We cannot control them completely to the point as we can control 10, at least not here, but with 32, we are close to doing that. So this is what's currently available in the laboratory. These are all individual atoms, nicely controlled, sitting next to each other. Now, what are these quantum processors that we have? Now, here we have, uh, of course, Intel inside. That's the Pentium, nothing quantum, classical. Here is our quantum processor. This is the variety that you find in the Vineland's group in Boulder, which is already miniaturized. You see, this is only about half a millimeter gap width between these plates that you've seen before, the same scheme that they operate with as we do. This is the trap that you've seen initially and that uh, I've now explained how this works. And of course, there are ions inside that carry the information. Now let me give you an example for a very simple quantum computation, the simplest quantum computation can, that you can think of. Think of the fact you want to make a bet. So you ask for a coin, let's throw a coin, and uh, then, of course, with 50% probability you will have either head or a tail. Oh, head or tail? No, this is a fake coin. It means you better check the coin before you actually make such a bet or make start that game. It could be fake. This would be the real coin. So what you do is you check it by having a coin. Ah, oh, I just take it here, turn it over, and look again. So you take two measurements. Now remember, if you had a quantum coin, I don't know how to do it. I, actually, I know how to do it, but it's a bit more complicated. Suppose you had a quantum coin. If you had a quantum coin, then, of course, a quantum coin could be taken into a superposition. A superposition, as you well know, is one entity which has the information simultaneously about zero or one. If there are two ones or two zeros, you would know. But classically, you would have to turn it over and measure it. But now, if you had a quantum machine, say a quantum computer, you could put the quantum coin in the slot and let the machine decide, is that real or is that fake? 
And the quantum computer, because the quantum computer is sensitive to superpositions, could give you the answer in a single class. In fact, you don't have to measure twice. You just have to make one computational operation to do this, because you have superpositions. Now you can actually see, if you have superpositions at large, how much a quantum computer could do in a single step. And that is important. This is by, for those specialists on the U, known as the deutsch joser algorithm, and we realized that with the quantum coin several years ago. And this is one of the most important, yet the simplest quantum uh, algorithms that has been demonstrated. And then again, for the general computer, of course, you want to do this with two ions in that trap. You want to realize that truth table with the control bit and the target bit, because that would allow you, together with the individual operations, to really build a universal quantum computer. OK, we've done that, and we've realized that. The details, again, don't matter, and this comes out here very nicely. We can actually do this, and nowadays with very high reliability. But what can you do with that? Let me give you an example. If you have these two atoms sitting side by side, and you make a measurement, as you well know, you either find the atom in state 1, then it's bright, it scatters fluorescence, or in state 0, it doesn't scatter fluorescence. So with two atoms sitting side by side, you would get, in a measurement outcome, these four results. 1, 1, 1, 0, 0, 1, 0, 0. This is classical information. Nothing new about that. With this, of course, I can do any kind of classical computation as we did before. But now, since these are quantum objects, I can make something which I can't do otherwise. I could possibly put a superposition at the first one. If I put a superposition at the first one and make then a quantum gate operation of the Xerox solid kind that I've shown you before with that truth table, we find the following outcome. If we measure then afterwards, we find either both ions bright or dark. We never find this. Isn't that funny? What does it mean? It really means the following. If I just make this and make the quantum operation just before I make the measurement, I could take these atoms apart. I put one in my pocket. As Wolfgang said the other day, I could, try, I could uh, go with a rocket to the moon. And then you would make, for example, a measurement here. And you would immediately know what kind of information I had here. That could be classical correlations, if I just define it in such a way. But in fact, since we have a quantum machine here, we have, what we have taken is a superposition beyond the distance from moon to Earth, if you would be able to do this. And the measurement only reveals what the outcome then is. We could not be able to tell before what really is done. I could also measure on the moon first. The system is not defined before I have measured, because only the measurement then finally projects the system. And in this way, we can actually really coin entanglement as a superposition over distances. These qubits become entangled by the quantum operation that is necessary to make these uh, quantum computers. This is the heart of a quantum computer. This is a strange world, but we can create these quantum correlations in such a way by just making a quantum gate operation. Here's again a picture that tries to visualize these things. It's not that easy, but it's not completely right, but it gives you some idea. Look at this picture right here. There's four boxes. And if you watch it, you either see it with the boxes sticking out to the front left or to the upper right. And please don't tell me that you see two front left and two with the front upper right. Nobody sees it that way. Is anybody here? Raise your hand. Thank you. I've never seen anybody doing that. It is just a correlation that we here see, and in this case, again, a classical correlation. I can't visualize the quantum correlation that's underlying. That's what you've seen here. But again, this is sort of a superposition of a distance that we have. This is the heart of entanglement. And entanglement, of course, is something else that we usually in everyday life see. But the definition is very much the same. Entangled is something that's inextricably interwoven and that cannot be separated in its parts without ripping things apart. So you have to be destructive to this, uh, disruptive here to, to make 
these measurements. And as long as we don't measure, things stay entangled. Entanglement is at the heart of a quantum computer, and that gives rise to these huge superpositions, to the possibility of having these computational paths interfere at large, so many of them, that even a few hundred qubits would have a huge computational power. Teleportation is based on entanglement. If you just look at the usual teleportation, as we know it from the Star Trek version, then it says, beam us up, Scotty, right here. That's not the way we do it here. Actually, uh, Charles Bennett, who came up with that teleportation protocol in quantum information, was here on Tuesday, and <laughs> we talked briefly about these things. The no cloning theorem usually says there is no quantum copy. But you want to transfer the original psi function or the opposition state to a remote position. How can you do it if you can't copy? And this idea was to use the teleportation protocol that he came up with and the procedure to do this, to, tra to tra transfer from A to B without actually observing the state. So in fact, what he does, he transfers the psi original from here to there in a quantum information version. Let me just briefly picturize you how this works. Suppose they have now Alice and Bob. These are the, the, the two uh, stars that we've seen several times this week. So Alice and Bob, they are supposed to share now an entangled pair. This, uh, the, the ellipse really should show this. Is, I actually have shown the constituents, which is not fair, because if you know the constituents already, then you have made a measurement in your, in your mind. So think of it. This is actually not known to you, but it's an entangled pair. Half of that pair goes to Alice, and half of that pair goes to Bob. Now, Alice has an unknown state, quantum information state, because it's a superposition, for example, which would be destroyed if you measure it. She superposes her superposition with that part of the entangled state and makes a measurement which is known as a Bell measurement, as we heard yesterday from uh, Alain Aspe, and then she gets a classical information about which one of the Bell states she has observed. And she takes a phone and conveys that information to Bob, who just receives the answer, I've got that Bell state. Okay. Bob says, fine, I'll take that, and I know now a procedure with my shared part, and makes on his turn some rotations, some qubit operations, and recovers that psi right here. This is the quantum information of beaming. This is not transferring mass or matter. It's transferring information that we do here. And we prepare two planks on each side, or actually to, to retrieve the state right here. And this was done in 2004, as Markus Bittiger mentioned to you both uh, simultaneously at the groups in Boulder of Dave Weinland and our Innsbruck team. And uh, here's just uh, the picture where we just transferred the information from here to there. In the Wineland team, they actually transferred the information over a larger distance. And nowadays, you have seen teleportation over distances of several meters in the group of uh, uh, Chris Monroe. I have to mention, this is not the first teleportation protocol. The teleportation protocol by Charlie Bennett was invented actually for photons. And those have been done in many other labs. Among those here, of course, uh, uh, the lab of Nicolas Gisin first and prior to what we did with atoms. This was just the first time we realized this with atoms, which, however, could only be real realized with quantum gate operations in those cases. OK, we're almost at the end of this. Let me just show you that this is real life. We do this really in the laboratory. It's nothing exotic. It's nothing that you can't do. We are touching these things in the labs. And if you want to see this, you want to have the experience, come and visit us. We show you how this works. It's nothing exotic, nothing mysterious. This is how a lab looks like. In fact, we look with the CCD camera at the atoms and the ions. They are sitting students, and they just run a computer program as you would run it too. This is a quantum computer program by just telling the lasers to switch on the individual atoms for a certain amount of time and just do the algorithm, as I've shown you before, by breaking down a complete process in pulses to one atom or two atoms or three atoms, whatever you have. And for this, we already have developed a quantum computer script language, which, which you see here, for example. So this can be done. We even can remotely run such a quantum computer. 
And the best thing that we ever have done is this task, this was a tour de force, where we really entangled with these operations eight ions. And we could actually test by these measurements that this is a genuine eight particle entanglement. The data that was taken took about 10 hours of uninterrupted running time of the quantum computer. To create that state takes about half a millisecond. But to analyze it, you have to take many, many more measurements to see what's actually underlying. And that shows you how much information is really available in these states. It took 10 hours to do this and uh, more than a half million measurements. But worse, it took several days to reconstruct that in a quantum way on a computer to make sure that we ha really have that kind of entanglement. And currently, the record is not only eight particle entanglement, we have recently achieved 14 particle entanglement over a longer distance, almost, almost a tenth of a millimeter long. So this is mesoscopic. Entanglement is not a microscopic entity. It is really macroscopic. And with photons, we have seen that many, uh, many times before. So we call this our quantum byte, and we are going on with this. Where's the future? Can we actually scale this up? You're I'm sure you're going to ask, when can I buy one? So when, when are we going to have a real quantum computer over the disk? Now we're on the way. We're doing our best. It's going to take a little while. But here you see our uh, tasks. This is, of course, the, uh, the new development by the Boulder Group, uh, Vineland, uh, uh, Planard trap. We are using here miniaturized traps that are sandwiched. And you can actually have companies doing this Lucent uh, uh, and Georgia Tech are now producing these Planard chips. Uh, Dick Slusher is doing that. This is, was done by Sandia in uh, New Mexico. These things are really looking more and more like chips, like microprocessors. And here's an idea of the Wineland Group by Didi Leifert and Dave Wineland, how to really make this possible now. We are transferring the information not by just having lasers and many more atoms simultaneously, that's a little hard to do, but by rather shifting the information that is available in here in such a region around, we move our ions. Instead of moving the electrons like in an ordinary computer, we move the ions that carry the information. And then we have laser beams that are shooting here, there, and making the operations. It really looks a little bit like Star Wars. So for example, here is a, a movie that was made by Ike Chuang at MIT, where you see how these ions can be moved in these individual traps, and actually there are additional ions there that do the cooling job, that do the readout job. So you can actually invoke these things on a chip, miniaturize things, and make these things highly parallel. So not only have you uh, just a, a single uh, string of bits like that, you can do this in a parallel fashion, as indicated here. You can move those ions simultaneously, have plenty of laser beams shooting all the time here, and doing this many thousand times a second. This is how we really envision how these things can be done in the future on a little chip. And here is the European counterpart within the programs what we recently have done over the last years. That trap that we started to use in 2000 has now been miniaturized in a so-called segmented trap here, a loading zone, the operation zone. And this is the micro trap consortium. We are running these traps now in seven laboratories in, in all over Europe. And these traps are very successful. And this is a worldwide effort. I just show you here uh, an advertisement sheet from the Ulm and Mainz microtraps, MIT, NIST, uh, Innsbruck, Maryland, uh, Michigan traps. Lots of these things are available. They all look alike. In order to move these ions around, you have small segments that apply the voltage, where you apply the voltages, and you just carry the information around. With this, I'm almost at the end of this. And let me just give you the vision, the dream here. The quantum way of doing computations is atomic quantum computation, as far as I told you. It's hard to read here. Let me just enlarge this. A quantum computer, it wouldn't operate on anything so mundane as physical laws. It would employ quantum mechanics, which quickly gets into things such as teleportation and alternate universes, and is, by all accounts, the weirdest stuff known to man. <laughs> okay. So much for that. I hope I could convince you that teleportation is a task we already achieved and we can do. Actually, it's routinely used in quantum cryptography lines with, uh, with uh, photons. This is something very heavy. We had uh, some of these questions already over the last few days. That will take a long, long while. And with this, I'm almost at the end. Let me just summarize by telling you again the dream that we all have 
is a quantum computer for the mathematical, physical sciences, and for some technical applications, but also for basic research. Many, many things I've shown you, and there are many more to come. On the way to an implementation, we, of course, need the precise control and manipulation of those quantum systems that can be applied and is currently already applied for metrology and fundamental experiments. I've already talked about some things that we now renewly visit quantum physics with the information-guided eye. And there are many more applications on the small scale before we actually go to the number crunching process that really will speed up to the point that we can do factorizing. The state of the art, as I said before, we have realized a computer with six and eight quantum bits routinely and demonstrated simple programs and first architectures you've seen come out of the MIT factory and other uh, laboratories and we already have entangled 14 ions and we are on our way to scale these things up and you see the beautiful uh, machinery that's now used and miniaturized as a quantum system. With this, the quantum way of doing computations I emphasize again is based on creating, handling and manipulating entanglement and superpositions. This is what I would like you to take home. Entanglement and superpositions are at the heart of this, are at the heart of quantum physics. And we really want to put entanglement to work and in Einstein's way of saying, we want to use the spooky action at a distance. With this, I'm finishing here and show you the quantum computer as it looks like in Innsbruck and I proudly say it's made in the Tyrol. <laughs> and it's made by a number of people, here's the team. And with this, I thank you for your attention. for uh, this uh, very impressive uh, presentation. J'aimerais uh, vous rappeler qu'on qu peut demander des questions. Il y a des, des, des formulaires uh, qui sont été distribués et, et donc uh, dans cinq minutes, nous venons et nous uh, avons une, ta une table ronde uh, à laquelle vos questions sont traitées. Donc on fait une pause de cinq minutes.
hatte eigentlich darauf gewartet, wo du diesen Artikel gezeigt hast, diesen wilden Artikel von US News und News, dass Particles don't as are not so mundane and obey physical laws, zu sagen, <lacht> it is physical laws, quantum physics is physical laws, ja, we are exactly natürlich. using physical laws. Genau, das hätte ich noch sagen sollen. Weil man das hier, weil das praktisch ein bisschen sozusagen... In Frage gestellt wird. Ja, vielleicht kommt es in der Frage raus. Es <lacht> ja, war mir eigentlich auf der Zunge ja. gelegen, hier zu sagen, äh, alles was wir machen... Is, is physical laws, ja. ...benutzt physical laws, wie sie eben im 20. Jahrhundert entwickelt wurden, ja. Ja, wir können... Ab und zu betone ich das ziemlich schwach. Aber es ist so selbst evident. Ganz schön hervorragend. Danke. Okay. Ich hoffe, es kam für die Leute an. Ja. Das ist die Aufzahl. Ich auch. Ja, super. Ich glaube auch die Dokumente, die Bilder am Ende, wie man es macht, es ist real. Ich glaube, das war wirklich. Es ist das Problem. Das, das sind ja auch sehr abstrakte Dinge und ich habe versucht. Versu und dadurch hast du es in die reale Welt gehoben. Das fand ja. ich prima. Das ist halt schwierig. Meine, man, man, ein paar von diesen Quantenkorrelationen, die, die, kann man nicht, die kann man nicht visualisieren. Aber hier, zumindest haben die Leute ein, ein bisschen ein Gefühl dafür. Also die, die Physik und auch die Faszination und mhm. die Standtechnik. Gut. Gut. Soll sein. without violating class inequality. I don't think so. But this is just a guess. But it must f my first reaction is if uh, it could, probably you could emulate everything with a classical computer. But maybe Nicola... Die Leute, die haben eine Scheu darüber nachzudenken. Die Köpfe haben anders funktioniert. Und die nächste Generation, die wirklich Fußball spielt und die geht, ist, die geht ganz anders drauf. Die hat ganz anders. <lacht> ich glaube, das ist der, die, mit die größte Sache am mhm. Arbeiten mit allen anderen Themen. Man traut sich plötzlich ganz andere Sachen zu fragen. Was wissen die da mittlerweile? Das sind Werkzeuge, das ist die Faxen nicht aus, so wie wir mit ja, genau. Telefon, Radio und Fernseher. Ja. 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 Donc, bonsoir. J'aimerais continuer avec la table ronde. Donc, the first question is as follows. Would a quantum computer require the development of new high-level programming languages <laughs> to replace the ones we already use? Not necessarily. Uh, we already have, as, I saw, as you saw in the talk, developed a certain script language that just helps us. But otherwise, we are using ordinary C++, C++ languages, you know, all the high languages that are there uh, to run these things. We just need a classical computer to accommodate all the tasks uh, that are necessary to run such a complicated system. And there's a lot of bookkeeping underneath to do this. I didn't even talk about. And, uh, but otherwise, you can do this perfectly OK with, with, with the current languages. OK, thank you. So uh, I have uh, an immense number of uh, questions. And if I bring all of them, we are still going to be here tomorrow at the we'll process eight them in parallel. So. <laughs> so. So. In parallel. <laughs> yeah. um, now, now w w one question here asks, um, why would it be useful to have uh, more than 300 qubits? Because you told us 
that that already consumes all degrees of freedom? This is a very good question. Uh, because uh, the 300 qubits just give you the number of computational paths in what we call our computational space, or as you heard this week, the, 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 the term is usually Hilbert space. This is huge, extremely huge space, and uh, we don't know personally, this is for me an open question, why is that space so, use, uh, so huge? Yeah, yeah. Because real life and nature makes only use of very little of that space. In fact, when we now take a factoring algorithm and really want to factor that number at 317 digits that I've shown you, and you would do the factoring process according to Shor's algorithm, you would actually need for all the bookkeeping and the error correction that we need in between to do this, more like several 10,000 of these qubits. 300 is not even enough. But again, I can't tell you why we need uh, so many, because we already have so many computational paths. This is a riddle, and we don't know why the Hilbert space that we build up is so huge and only sparsely used. Okay, he, here I have a, a listener who comes up with two questions. He asked the uh, first question, at what temperature do you do your experiments? The temperature is, uh, is room temperature for the entire apparatus, so we, but we do the same thing as Wolfgang Ketteler told you on uh, Tuesday, uh, we cool down with lasers the ensemble of, of, uh, of our ions. And if I would assign a temperature, then this is a little tricky question because with single particles and individual measurements, th then temperature builds up only as an average quantity over time. If you have very many particles, then of course some of them are moving, some of them are moving less, as you heard by Wolfgang, then you can assign a temperature. But if you have a single particle, then you already have to build up statistics again, as the way I explained it, before you can assign a temperature. If you would assign a temperature in our case, it would be about half a millikelvin. It's fairly hot compared with what Wolfgang Ketteler told you. But in each individual experiment where we start in the ground state, the notion of a temperature is not appropriate. So it's very hard to answer that question in temperature-wise. Here is a questioner who, who, who says, this quantum computing reminds me of fuzzy logic. Is there any analogy? I don't know enough about fuzzy logic <laughs> to tell you th really that answer, but fuzzy logic is purely classical. Uh, <coughs> and uh, here, we have a quantum correlations and we have quantum information. <coughs> so at the first glance I would say no, but uh, I can't give you a definite answer. Maybe some of the others could do that. <coughs> I mean, th there are various computing schemes where parallel processes play a role, and I think this is also the case in, in fuzzy logic and is of course the case in, in quantum computing, but the big difference is that all schemes except for quantum computings work with bits where there's one bit in one bit and in a quantum computer there's a qubit so that's really a decisive difference. Okay, maybe here's a, a general question. Uh, ca can a photon carry a qubit? And if yes, what kind of devices work with photons? Voila, this is for Voila. Mm -hmm. Yes. A photon can carry a qubit, but with photon there is a big problem. It is a flying qubit. <laughs> <laughs> uh, because it cannot be stopped. So if you want to use a photon as a qubit, it's fine. And yesterday I gave an example. You can encode a qubit on the polarization of a photon. But again, the fact that you cannot stop the photon is a serious problem. This problem is addressed by several groups in the world including the group of Nicola here, and the idea is to encode the information that you have on one photon, encode it on a crystal. And so now you have a crystal which is here, and you have encoded the information of the photon. And the, 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 the game consists... Oh, j'aurais dû parler en français, une fois de plus. Et donc, vous avez votre qubit qui est codé dans le, dans le, dans le cristal, et 
l'opération a du succès si, à un moment que vous choisissez vous-même, vous pouvez décider de refaire émettre le même photon avec la même information codée que celle qui avait été codée initialement dessus à partir de votre cristal. Donc, euh, oui, les photons font partie des qubits qui sont euh, utilisés pour l'information quantique avec cette complication supplémentaire, mais qui présente aussi certains avantages. Tout inconvénient a un avantage. Ça va Pour la comme dit Nicolas, pour la communication quantique, c'est un avantage d'avoir un bit volant, un flying qubit. Merci Alain. Uh, une autre question, une autre question est, do you think that one day uh, teleportation will be used by everybody, also for items, and uh, consequently all, all the actual means of transportation will be uh, resolved with no more pollution. <laughs> well, teleportation would mean that literally, in a quantum sense, but I can explain it classically, that your body is taken apart and all the information about all the atoms and molecules in your brain, in your fingers, in your skin, this is sent to another location. And of course the moustache, as Alain <laughs> pointed out. <laughs> so all this information is sent to another location, and then in this other location, people assemble you, you assemble your body based on this information. I'm asking you, even if it would be possible, would you like to take the risk? <laughs> And of course, the information about all those cells, about all the neurons in your brains, it is enormous. It is completely out of the current capability to obtain this information and transfer it. Teleportation has been successfully applied to single particles which have a spin up, a spin down, or a superposition state. And this information could be obtained, transmitted as was pointed out today in this talk, from Alice to Bob, and then this information could be used to reassemble or reconstruct the quantum state. Thank you. Uh, next question. Um, does the human brain use quantum computing? <laughs> as far as we know, not. Mm -hmm. There are some suggestions by, for example, Roger Penrose and a few others uh, but to our best, the best of our knowledge, not. And the reason for that is that uh, the brain and most living cells are at uh, a temperature where coherence is, and superpositions don't survive for a very long time. But I would not totally exclude it. Uh, there's no conclusive uh, statement at this time. Uh, this is the best of our knowledge. Maybe some others have ideas. I think we should not be too <laughs> firm on that. We, no. we don't know. We there don't may know. be some protected uh, right. uh, states, and uh, it seems that some serious people consider it. That's, uh, that's right. There are some serious considerations, but as I said, to the best of my knowledge, not. OK. So somebody fairly knowledgeable wants to know that even if we try to make vacuum, there are always a few atoms left. And don't they interfere with, with your chain of ions? They do, because they collide with the chain of, uh, of ions. But the, the, the vacuum that we, have is, uh, that we have is such that this uh, interference or that uh, this such collision happens maybe once every hour or so. Mm -hmm. uh, so that is usually not very perturbative, but it happens. Maybe we should add, if it happens, in principle, the errors associated with that can be detected and corrected. Right. Also, in a complicated computer chip, occasionally some errors happen, but an algorithm has to be robust oh. enough to correct for those events. Here is another question. Uh, who, who says, I would like to say uh, thank you to the organizers and sponsors of this event. Uh, question is, uh, no, it's more a comment. And, uh, 
the comment is uh, neither as a speaker nor as any citation in, in the works have I seen a, a woman. So what about women in at the frontier of quantum physics? Yes, there are some. I'm sorry that I, I'm not one of the organizers, so I'm not responsible for the invitation. <laughs> <laughs> but, but maybe you, you, you can as mention a few examples of, uh, of women who have uh, done prominent things. In quantum physics? Well, I was Many. glad that we could welcome Mrs. Bell this evening. <laughs> and unfortunately, this may be characteristic that the fraction of female graduate students and female researchers is on the order of 20 and 30 percent. So if you take the four of us and Mrs. Bell, you have a statistical average. <laughs> Uh, I think it's correct to say that uh, this reflects the bad situation of women in general in, uh, in, in physics. I mean, if there were 50% women in, fixi in physics, statistically, you would have a 50% achievement by, uh, by women. So uh, I it's true we can regret uh, this uh, situation, but it's not particularly the fault of uh, quantum physics. I mean, it's... Uh, <laughs> okay. Okay. So, so I, I, I think it's but safer. Let, I mean, it's safer to let, change. Ah. Let, let me add on, <laughs> on, on, on that. Okay. So it, it's very clear that the situation is bad for women in the sense that the proportion of the women is low, is small. Um, but I, from the experience I have definitely have from our university and also from other universities I visit is that physics, uh, that, that women studying physics, working in physics, uh, female scientists in physics, um, definitely enjoy what they are doing and they are um, of course encouraged and, and well supported and um, they have a great time. I mean, th th this is and very the numbers clear. And the numbers are increasing so I... Uh, Let's wait a few years, I think, then you're approaching 50%. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, l let's uh, uh, go back to uh, science. That's maybe a safer ground. <laughs> <laughs> safer, <heavy. laughs> So, so one question is, uh, can you, uh, and uh, is, is your leftmost atom entangled with the rightmost atom? Yes. Mm -hmm. oh, that's a fast answer. <laughs> <laughs> There's, there are a number of questions which uh, ask about the limitations due to uh, decoherence of the quantum states uh, when we use a large number of qubits. That is a, indeed a very serious question and we are uh, working at the time right now very hard to understand this in, in more detail. The decoherence comes about from various processes. The most important one, of course, are any uh, processes that perturb the entire system, that do an inadvertent measurement, for example, because measurements project and, of course, destroy the quantum information. For example, when you have a collision, then that would render your quantum information useless. So avoid collisions. We go to high vacuum. Then there is the state itself. The state, the qubit, can possibly decay by sending out a fluorescence photon. We can avoid this by putting this in a state that lives very long. In fact, we have uh, shown in this way that this is called the so-called decoherence-free subspace for the experts, that we can have entanglement lifetimes of more like 30 seconds. So 30 seconds is a very long time for entanglement and survives that, that much. And so you can go through all the technical details and this is what we are doing. We are currently suffering most from technical issues like fluctuating magnetic fields. Uh, they can be stabilized because you have currents that flow through coils and they have little uh, fluctuations and things like that. Uh, it's mostly technical limitations. I don't think that 
uh, decoherence is a fundamental problem here. A young student wants to know what uh, books or articles you can uh, recommend to someone who wants uh, to fabricate um, a, 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 a computer with quantum technology. <laughs> 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 That's a very hard question <laughs> because you would have first to decide on what kind of technology you really want to use. Uh, there is, there is, uh, if, you, if you want to contact me, to, to, to send me an email, I'll send you some of the, the, the sources. But if you really want to look for the basic th things, there's this famous book by Ag Chuang and uh, Michael Nielsen that I absolutely recommend to everybody. And there's a second one, a travel guide to Tyrol. <laughs> <laughs> yes, you're welcome. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it can be done in the basement, I'm sure. It can, can even be done in the garage. If the garage is clean enough and air-conditioned, I think it's fine. <laughs> okay, here I think is a good question. Since quantum computing is based on probabilities, what is the fi fiability of the result? I, let me just rephrase that question. I think you're pointing out a very important point here. Because we finally get results with a certain probability only. Mm -hmm. Is it sufficient, that's actually your question, to run the quantum computer once? No. If you want to, say, factor numbers, say, run the Shor algorithm, you would have to run it several times to get the probabilistic answer to make sure that you get that right. But just with an algorithm like a Shor algorithm, it's fairly easy to check whether you get the right answer or not because multiplication is an extremely fast procedure. So you have to run it several times to get probabilistic answers. That's the answer. So, so if we take this and count, and that's the next question, is it sure that quantum computers will still be faster than classical computers? Yes, because uh, mm -hmm. there is an exponential speed up, and you have to run it only a few times to get mm -hmm. the, the result. Uh, well. Okay, then I get again uh, questions about uh, quantum computing and the brain. And uh, the question is, uh, uh, does, does this coming out of the laboratory of uh, quantum computer represent any danger to the individual brain? Not that I know of, at least <laughs> I'm, still, uh, I'm still sane. Uh, maybe others judge differently, but I think I'm okay. The only danger is that the quantum virus is addictive. <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay, I don't. Uh, or another question is, and this really goes to the heart of quantum computing, why is it any good to have quantum superpositions if one determines, them, uh, determines the result only if one, at the moment one observes it? Why is it any good to have quantum superposition since uh, it, it seems to play a role only at the very end when one measures? No, that's not true. Mm -hmm. The quantum superpositions play a role during the entire processes. Remember, we break down all the processes in single qubit operations and uh, two qubit operations. That's the simplest way, but there are other uh, procedures. But during that time, there is continuous superposition going on. and in these all computational paths, they have to interfere to give you the right result. So you need the superposition all the time, otherwise there's no speed up. Mm -hmm. Okay, now, now we get uh, again uh, to more philosophical questions about uh, quantum measurement. And here the question is, does an observation require a living and thinking creatrice? Yes. Well, this, this question, of course, uh, is asked uh, all the time, okay? Mm -hmm. And uh, I think absolutely not. Uh, because, <laughs> for instance, when I detect a photon, uh, there is, this photon is detected by a photomultiplier, and then it goes to a memory in a computer, and finally it can be written on a piece of paper. And something which is written with ink 
on a piece of paper. I doubt that it is not written even if there is nobody to read it. Okay, so uh, in my opinion, the answer, it's a pragmatic answer, it's not a philosophical answer, but mm. from a pragmatic point of view, because the result of a measurement can be written on a piece of paper, I have a hard time thinking that the piece of paper is not written if I don't watch it. Mm. Well, uh, okay, uh, it's uh, hard for me to read even the questions at the speed you are answering them. <laughs> uh, yes, <laughs> okay. So uh, here uh, the question is, uh, what is the material uh, reality? Uh, a, a view, uh, the result, or a look, at the result of a look? Say again, what's the, ma what's the material of what? Uh, what is the material reality? What is the material yes. reality? Okay. Alan, this is, uh, maybe ah, you need some it's French a very expertise. Oh, yeah. It's a philosophical question. Ah, mm -hmm. Qu'est-ce que la réalité matérielle? Mm -hmm. What is material reality? Is it mm -hmm. a look or the result of a look? It boils down to the previous question. I mean, is, do we create mm -hmm. uh, a reality by observing it? Mm -hmm. Well, mm -hmm. you, you can answer. I, I ask the question. Do you create reality by observing it? Indeed. <laughs> yes. Uh. yes. Maybe. Let, let me add to it. it. It's a philosophical question about reality, and unfortunately, or fortunately, science cannot make clear statements about philosophical questions. But I can only tell you what most scientists assume. We assume that the world exists out outside us and that, that we are observers to the world, that uh, particles move, quantum systems evolve, mm -hmm. whether we observe them or not, and quantum systems have in evolved even before we figured out how quantum mechanics work. So we assume there is a reality to the world which we scientists reveal, and to continue what Alain says, we also think that quantum measurements are taken the moment the quantum superposition state has been measured or projected with a classical device. In other words, if a photo detector makes click, the click is macroscopic, the click is classical. At that moment, the quantum superposition state has disappeared and the answer of the measurement has been encoded in a classical system. And whether it's a bit in your classical computer, a click of the photomultiplier, or a written record on a piece of paper, we all th assume that this is a permanent record and that it exists independent of the human brain. Okay, uh, here, here some uh, listener says, we are all quantum mechanical objects. So could uh, a wave, uh, energy in the form of a wave uh, from space uh, influence our behavior? I'm not sure how to answer that question. What is that wave? I mean, if yeah, there is cosmic rays coming and impinging on us all the time, I was just as visiting CERN and saw the neurons coming down on us, of course they can cause uh, change us by causing all kinds of uh, genetic problems and uh, things like this. So this happens. Uh, this is natural to us, but I wouldn't know what you mean by a cosmic wave here. I'm not sure I can answer that. Yeah, I, I think that's the active part. I mean, sunshine, the photons are waves, and they certainly influence my behavior. That, that's very clear. Um, and there are also other ways of which we are well aware which control and affect our behavior. That's also clear. Um, of course, one may speculate whether there are um, magic quantum waves or whatever are coming from the universe which influence in some way or the other. We don't have any experimental indication or suggestion that this is indeed the case. So that would be mere or is mere speculation. 
Yeah, I, I, I think we, we are coming uh, to, to an end. I, I would like to all thank you for uh, answering uh, all uh, these uh, questions. And uh, with this, I would like to close uh, this uh, roundtable uh, discussion. Thank you very much.